All right. So next up, we have uh, Abul Fazal, Fazal Hashmi from uh, Purdue University. He's an assistant professor there in the electrical and computer engineering department. Uh, so he has uh, takes this perspective of optimization and then studies problems in learning and games uh, and distributed decision making, and then to see how you know the, uh, these algorithms can be designed efficiently with mathematical guarantees for deployment. And uh, so welcome, Abul Fazal. Can have you here? Thank you. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for the introduction. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. I'm, I'm glad to, uh, to have the opportunity to talk about one of our recent work uh, about no regret learning in dynamic and secular games. Uh, before that, I, I, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators here who contributed a lot in this work, especially Niklas, who was the main contributor. And uh, here, I don't know if you can see, but uh, I've provided a link to the, to the paper on archive. Just want to let you know that the paper has recently been accepted uh, to activate transactions on automatic control. So thank you. Oh, oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a mad games workshop. So uh, multi-agent dynamic games, and this is also the motivation for our work. Many scenarios where we have to make. Uh, decisions sequentially in environments where we may have other agents who may or may not be cooperative. And this is like a dynamic online learning scenario. Uh, and uh, in this fork, what we have done, we have basically uh, proposed a new uh, formulation for a specific kind of multi-agent dynamic games, which we refer to it as uh, dynamic secular games. And, and you can think of it as merging two formalism of uh, uh, secular games and Markov decision process. Uh, so I just want to talk uh, briefly about these two uh, concepts. Uh, first of all, the secular games, uh, which is a very celebrated um, framework proposed in 1934. And that is a, a game theory formulation uh, between two players, uh, which play a game uh, 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 sequentially, so not simultaneously. In particular, we have two agents, the leader and the follower. Uh, the leader plays what we refer to it as a mixed strategy. You can uh, think of it as a probability vector over uh, the pure strategies or actions that are available to the, to the leader. Uh, the follower then sees this mixed strategy and plays an individual response or best responding action to this mixed, mixed strategy. And then you can think of that uh, the leader now samples uh, an action from this distribution X and finally, both the leader and follower receive payoffs, uh, rewards, according to their payoff uh, functions, R and U, which may be uh, different. And the second against has uh, found quite a few number of activations um, uh, recently, uh, in particular in scenarios where you want to allocate resources uh, for security applications. So there are a number of uh, resources and you have some uh, like some budget and you want to allocate these budgets to, to cover these uh, resources. Uh, you can think of uh, applications to a scheduling, uh, a security scheduling at, uh, at airports, randomized patrol routes by uh, Coast Guard, and also like uh, patrol patterns for park rangers to, uh, to battle illegal poaching. Uh, but in almost all of the existing works, uh, and the, the scenario is essentially a limited setting. Uh, so there is no notion of dynamics, in particular, it may be plausible to think that the uh, because of some uh, dynamic nature of the environment, uh, the utility functions of the leader and the follower, for instance, uh, change over time. And we have to account that in our uh, 
uh, formalism to be able to come up with uh, strategies to tackle this resource allocation problems in dynamic settings. And also another limitation is that uh, because this in a sense is a non-cooperative game, uh, we may be able, to, we need to deal with scenarios where we don't have perfect information about the, uh, the other player, in this case, the follower. So we want to tackle both of those uh, limitations in this work. So I mentioned Markov decision process, uh, and that is um, our approach to extend the secular games to the, to the dynamic setting. So MDPs are defined by a tuple. Uh, we have a state space, uh, we have an action space, uh, we have a reward function, and a probability transition kernel. Okay, so state and action uh, uh, should be a server to understand. The reward is basically the reward of uh, that the agent receives according to the state that, it, that the agent sees and the action that it, uh, it takes in that particular state. And the, this P is the probability transition kernel, which basically dictates uh, uh, how the agent is gonna tra uh, like, uh, transition in the environment. So here's how we play like, a, like an MDP. Uh, in particular, the environment specifies a state and uh, let's say a reward to the agent. The agent receives the states and the, the, the reward and base of the history is gonna like, come up with a policy to, to, to determine what could be the next action to play according to, uh, to, to, the, to the state that the agent currently is. So the agent plays that action and then the, the environment is gonna like, uh, give the, the next state and reward to the agent and uh, we're gonna do this uh, uh, over and over. All right, so, so now based on this concept of secular games and MDPs, we propose this uh, framework of dynamic secular games, okay? So it is again a tuple in the same street as MDPs. Uh, we have the state uh, uh, space and the action space for the leader, so, so uh, that's our assumption. Uh, and now we have this action space for the follower, okay, the other agent that's playing the game. We have again the, the reward function uh, that specifies the reward of the leader. Uh, however, we also have this utility function for the follower. One thing that I want to point out here is that the utility function of the follower does not depend on state. So that is one assumption that we make. And finally, we have the probability transition kernel, which basically determines how the leader is gonna evolve over time according to the to his current state, the action it takes, the action of the follower, and uh, so basically, this basis is what could be the next step. All right, so this is how we're going to play the dynamic cycle game. Uh, so the leader receives the state and reward, very similarly to, to MVP. Then it's going to come up with a mixed strategy. So this part is very similar to a stackable game. Now the follower is going to see this mixed strategy. It's going to play an action. And then uh, both of them are going to receive some reward. Uh, the leader according to the R function, the follower according to the utility function U from the environment. And then we're gonna repeat this over and over again. All right, so just want to briefly touch about the related work because game theory uh, is a very rich field. Uh, but in summary, uh, um, most of the works have focused on uh, like scenarios where let's say there is no dynamic, but there is repeated interaction. Uh, Maybe uh, the, there is dynamics, however, the, uh, the actions are chosen simultaneously as opposed to the stackable games. And or, um, scenarios where we have the like, continuous setting, the continuous time, continuous, uh, continuous uh, spaces, and with perfect information. Uh, uh, on the other hand, in this work, we focus on the discrete state, uh, state scenario, and uh, the scenario where, the, where we play the game sequentially, and we don't have perfect information. By perfect information, here I mean the leader doesn't know necessarily what is the utility function of the follower uh, that uh, the follower uses to come up with his actions. All right. Uh, so we mentioned MDPs, right? And uh, MDPs related to RL. So one way to talk about RL formally is MDP. And you you may ask, okay, what is the connection to RL? Okay. And in fact, there is a connection, and we can reduce this dynamic cycle games to a to an MDP. Okay, uh, um, so at a high level, 
this MDP is going to have a probability transition kernel, which is unknown to the leader, and also a reward function that is also unknown, because both of these depend on the utility of the follower that the leader doesn't know. Okay. Uh, so, so basically, we may be able to utilize fonder free RL algorithms such as Q-learning and, and SARSA to, to, to come up with the policy for the, for the leader. However, one um, sort of drawback is that because we assume that the leader plays this mix, mixed strategy, this reduced MDP is going to have now a continuous uh, action space. Which is going to make it like quite uh, difficult to solve using Q learning assessor because we have to like discretize the action space and that's going to uh, basically result in a very very large action space and we know from the theoretical analysis of these algorithms that the regret depends actually the number of states and actions okay so so we are interested in this work to see whether we can come up with a different approach uh, that is more scalable if you will uh, uh, compared to the Q learning and source algorithm. All right, so, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the learning problem that we have, this notion of regret, which helps us to formalize our theoretical guarantees, and also some of the assumptions that we have uh, to come up with, the, with this uh, theoretical analysis. All right, so this is our learning problem. Uh, suppose the follower's utility U is fixed and unknown. Okay, so that's the imperfect information setting. Now, we are interested to come up with an online learning algorithm that computes a sequence of policies uh, for the uh, leader in each episode T uh, and time step H. So I'm going to talk briefly about those in the next slide that minimizes the, lead, uh, the, uh, the leader agent's regret. So this is the regret. So the regret is basically the difference between uh, the best policy that you could have done in hindsight if you knew like the uh, everything, in particular also the utility function of the, uh, the follower, minus what the agent plays, okay? So I think this is like a, a good way to talk about this pictorially. So if I, uh, if I knew everything, this would be the best policy. So uh, I receive like the, the highest reward possible across time. But now if I have like a good policy for my learning agent, uh, I'm going to gradually approach the reward that I could have gotten uh, from the space policy. And the difference between the two is this the cumulative regret. All right, so, so some of the assumptions that we have. So uh, we talked about MDPs, uh, and in particular, we focus on episodic, what we refer to as episodic MDPs, which basically says that you can uh, partition the state space into edge layers. And this is a very nice, uh, the thing to talk about scenarios where the learning is episodic, right? So and you have a number of episodes to uh, um, to interact, and each episode is uh, has a limited length, let's say h, okay? And uh, so in this case, we also assume that the transition only exists from one layer to the next. So we we proceed uh, in this MDP in these layers. All right, and this is one of the assumptions that we have, uh, which is which might be. Um, some uh, which might be restricted, and we are actually interested to find a way to generalize this uh, as part of our future work. So we assume that the follower's utility function is linearly parameterized. Okay, so this limits the uh, the utility function, uh, the family of the utility functions that we can work with. Okay, so in particular, we have we assume that we have these uh, uh, functions f that you can think of these as like uh, factors or features, and this parameter theta star. So we assume that we don't know this theta star, by v I mean the leader, but we know this function f. So basically the way to interpret this is as follows, that I know as the leader, I know which factors are important to the follower. However, I don't know the specific preference that the follower has over these factors. And I'm interested to basically recover that, okay? And just for the ease of the notation, when I want to talk about the learning algorithm, uh, because we know this F and we know the A's and uh, B's, we can form this feature matrix, okay? So basically this feature matrix is defined for each action B of the follower. And each row in this matrix is basically the feature associated with the IS action played by the leader and the BS action played by the follower. 
Okay, so therefore it's the n by p, where p is the dimension of this uh, uh, unknown vector theta star, which dictates the uh, preference of the uh, follower over these factors. All right, so now I think now we are ready to talk about the, the learning algorithm, and it's actually quite simple. Uh, so basically, what will happen is that, uh, let's say we play a mixed strategy X, okay? So this notation means it belongs to the property simplex. And now we observe a best responding action played by the follower, okay? Because this is a best responding action, we know that for any other action played by the follower, we have this inequality, okay? So this basically means, this is basically the definition of the best responding action. So the follower is gonna respond in a way uh, that the action played has the highest utility compared to any other action available to the follower, okay? Now, uh, uh, we can um, do some very simple algebraic manipulations. In particular, all we need here is uh, the linearity of expectation and also the fact that we assume the utility function is linear, which means that we can exchange some expectations and uh, inner products uh, to come up with this last line. Now, this last line is interesting because this is basically a half a space extended into the direction of the test star. So, therefore, we can imagine this sequence of X's and B's that uh, are played over time as samples coming from this half a space. So this half a space is unknown because we don't know theta star. However, we receive samples from it uh, in the form of X and B. So therefore we may be able to leverage these samples in an optimization problem to come up with a good uh, learning policy for the leader. And at the same time, try to estimate this theta star. So that would be our goal. And this is what we uh, can do to basically formalize what I talked about. We define uh, the so-called version space of what theta star could be given past observation. Uh, so without loss of generality, we assume that theta as a uh, norm, which is one. So if it's bounded, it's okay. Uh, and then it has to be consistent with the samples that we have received. Okay, so we form this uh, version space and we're gonna use that as a constraint in an optimization problem. So this is a convex set. And this is our optimization problem which is gonna help us to jointly learn the policy for the leader and also estimate this theta star, okay? So let's see what, uh, how it looks. So uh, we want to maximize the value function for the leader. So this is basically the Bellman equation, such that uh, the theta that we find belongs to this version space. Uh, our mixed strategy belongs to the probability simplex. And also we have this constraint. So this constraint we saw in the previous uh, step. However, I add this slack uh, variable here, epsilon, okay? Uh, because of this epsilon and because of uh, our objective, we refer to this, object, uh, to this problem or the policy that we learn from this optimization problem as an optimistic epsilon conservative problem, a policy. Why optimistic? Because we are basically assuming that whatever action was played by the follower uh, is going to result in the, uh, or whatever the state of story is, is going to result in, in the highest value for the uh, for the leader. Okay, so that's the optimistic part. We are being optimistic with respect to what theta star can be. And it's epsilon conservative because of this stack that I allow here. Okay, so ideally we want this epsilon to be zero. However, it, it may happen that if we set this epsilon to be zero, the sequence of X and Bs that, we, that we're gonna encounter are not gonna be informative enough to help us to estimate theta star. So basically by this, I allow, uh, so basically by this, I enforce this constraint that my samples to be informative, okay? And this epsilon basically uh, the, uh, is gonna be determined as part of our theorem. So there, there is a trade-off between uh, uh, like informativeness, which is captured by increasing epsilon, and also like uh, uh, the connection to the optimal policy that is captured by uh, making epsilon smaller. So we have to like tune this, uh, this trade-off to find what could be the best epsilon. All right, so this is the learning scheme. So very similar to 
what we talked about before about secondary games and MGPs. Uh, let's say we have some policy. So the, the, the learner, which is the leader in this case, is going to use this policy for the entire episode to interact with the follower. Okay. So this part is very similar to, uh, to the secondary games that we talked about. Okay. And then uh, we're going to gather all of these samples as part of the interaction with the follower. We're going to use them to update the version of space on theta star that I talked about, and then use this uh, to compute a new policy for the next episode. All right, so we have this, uh, we have a, like, a, uh, like a, a theory on the regret of the learning algorithm. Uh, so basically, the theorem says that with high probability, the regret is upper bounded in such a way that it is independent of the state space. That is nice and in some sense intuitive because the um, um, because we assume that the follower doesn't depend on the spaces, only the leader depends on the spaces. So the fact that the the regret is independent of the spaces is very nice here. Uh, it is sublinear in the size of the follower's action space. It is linear uh, in inside of the leader's action space and episode H. So this part we are not sure whether we are tight. Uh, uh, and the last part of the regret guarantee is that it depends on the number of rounds and the number of uh, features P in this particular way. So if you are familiar with the literature in online learning, uh, you may think that this is very uh, this is very bad because, for instance, it's not a square root. However, we had a follow up. Uh, I mean, uh, there was a follow up work uh, to our paper that shows that in fact the dependence on P here is optimal. So. Uh, we cannot uh, hope to improve. It. All right. So with that, I'm just going to basically talk about some very simple experimental results, which are aimed to verify our theory. So um, there are a few things that I want to like, uh, verify. First of all, the dependence on the dimension. OK, so, so what we have done here, we have uh, basically constructed like a uh, simulated dynamic cycle games that is um, aim to like tackle one of those uh, security-based resource allocation problems that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, so here, what we are verifying is basically the dependence on the dimension. So what will happen is that as I increase the dimension, the number of features available to the follower, the regret gets forced. Okay, so and this is consistent with, the, with our theory. Uh, the next thing I want to verify is uh, being independent of the size of the state space. And here uh, we have some, uh, we have a basic, again, uh, uh, dynamic Sega games. And as we can see here, as I change the size of the state space of the leader, I don't see like too much deviation in the regret. So this, this is again, it's consistent with our theoretical guarantee and the regret analysis that stated that the regret is independent of the size of the state space. And uh, finally, I mentioned connection to RL, uh, model free RL, SARSA algorithm in particular. So here uh, we compare with SARSA and like a, like a random policy just uh, uh, as, a, as a benchmark. And we, can, and, and we also op we calculate this optimal policy using backward induction uh, and assuming that we know theta star. And as you can see here, our algorithm indeed achieves a sublinear regret and it, it is able to uh, outperform both SARSO and this random policy uh, method. All right, uh, with that, I'd like to conclude and state some of the future works that we have. So, so basically, uh, we introduced a new formalism that is aimed to characterize some uh, forms of mad games. Um, uh, we developed an, an, a new learning algorithm, which is based on this idea of optimistically building epsilon conservative policies uh, to jointly learn the policy and also estimate the unknown preference of the follower. And we also like complemented this algorithm with some theoretical guarantee uh, and show that it actually performs well in practice. So, uh, so by this, I mean like beating SARSO in that particular example. Uh, some future direction, uh, I mentioned that some of our um, the dependence of the regret on some parameters may not be tight, so we aim to study that. And also, it would be great to extend the uh, this to the scenarios where the utility function of the follower is not necessarily a linear function.
All right, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Again, this is a link to the paper and this is a link to uh, my website. I would be uh, glad uh, to answer if any question you may have. We can take some questions at the microphone. Please come. Uh, thank you for your brief. Uh, uh, actually, I have read this paper. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, I have a question for your comment. You know, I remember that uh, you were talking about follow-up in this book, right? So, I mean, in more general setting, well, the uh, other type of things, in general, the follow-up that come out, I understand that you're either not my other follow-up, but you know, it's a one-way thing. So, you know, you can do it in my other follow-up. Can you input the more challenging thing is to be doing more challenging things on this follow-up? Uh, right uh, so so yeah that's that's a good uh that's a good question um i think we have to like um, potentially significantly like change our our uh, derivations a little bit because as you can see here this part uh, relies heavily on the assumption of being myopic right uh but that's a that's a great question, and I'm interested to actually uh, talk a little bit more about that there as offline. If you have any ideas, yeah, thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Amir Bokani. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about your assumption about the the feature matrix. Um, I'm curious. If that is the the assumption is that you are already know what is the most important thing in relation to the leader and the follower, correct? Right. So 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 I assume that I'm the leader, right? And I have a certain number of actions available. So that I assume I know. I also assume that I know the individual actions that are available to the follower. That I know as well. And I know that uh, the follower does, has some, some features available, this F, so that I know as well. What I don't know is, is theta star only, right? So uh, does that answer your question? So you're, you don't know the actual relationship between the two. You're assuming that they are for the different purposes. Yeah, so, so for instance, in that uh, like uh, poaching example, like maybe uh, I know that if I like uh, take a particular, if I like find a, the time of the year to like uh, set some patrolling routes or something, the poachers have like, uh, are gonna like uh, maybe have some actions available to them, like maybe like focus on a, on a particular animal versus the other. So those I know. However, I don't know like uh, how they're gonna determine this preference, right? So how much preference they have on a particular animal versus the other one, or maybe a particular region over the other region. I see. So for each domain setting that you would apply to, uh, the feature matrix will have to be. Essentially, exactly, 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 yeah, exactly. Okay. Do you see that becoming uh, computationally infeasible as the problem becomes more complex? Uh, eventually, this matrix will be very, very large, and you cannot, you might not be able to map everything you need to do. But that assumption may not hold in a large um, setting. Yeah, so. Yeah, so that's a good question, right? So because the size of this depends on the number of actions, right? So P, we can imagine that it's a small, I think, right? So, uh, but N and M can be large. However, if, for instance, if there is any like uh, structure in this matrix, like a sparsity, for instance, uh, uh, we may be able to leverage that uh, to actually like, for instance, store this in memory or something. Uh, but yeah, in general, like if there is no structure and the number of actions are quite large for both the leader and follower, then I agree that this may be like very uh, uh, intensive to hold in memory or work with uh, to come up with the, with the policy. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thank you. So do you have any preliminary thoughts on how we can generalize to the case where the follower's utility function is not good? Um, so maybe uh, linearizing it could help or uh, so, so basically from a more theoretical or algorithmic perspective, uh, 
the linearity is leveraged here, right? So that I can exchange it and come up with this half space, okay? So if we don't have this linearity and then I can massage it in a different way, I may come up with a, like a different, uh, uh, like a algebraic or linear algebraic structure that I have to impose as a constraint in my optimization problem. As long as I can come up with that, then I think that would be fine. Uh, so that's one part that the linearity comes in the picture. The other part, of course, is the total analysis. Uh, in fact, um, I was in the, actually interested in like some risk sensitive scenarios, maybe exchanging, changing this expectation with some other notion, maybe SIVA. That's also not linear. And that actually like uh, makes the analysis quite a bit more involved. So I think it's a difficult problem, but definitely a meaningful and interesting one to tackle. Yeah, and also a question for me, um, if you, have you observed any relation from uh, between the results that you get and also the value of epsilon that you choose? Like... Right. Uh, so for the result that I showed, I actually, uh, we, yeah, we, so epsilon depends on, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, 1 over t to the p or something. So it, it, epsilon is proportional to 1 over t. And in the result that I showed, we actually uh, set epsilon according to our theory. Yeah. So I think I have it in my supplementary slide, but I, if you are, if you have time, I can show that. If not, I can. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right. Let's go over for the next.